Good morning, everyone. I hope you are all enjoying our book-themed budget breakfast. I am sure you all had great expectations for this morning. Um, but for the next 10 minutes, it's over to the little women. Um, I'm going to start with the Chancellor's announcement that the furnished holiday lettings regime is to be abolished. Uh, many landlords with holiday rentals are still recovering from the effects of the COVID pandemic, and these changes will be yet another blow to their profits. The government's stated aim is to increase long-term rental options for local people in places like Frinton and Aldborough, Wales next to the sea, where holiday homes make up a significant percentage of the housing stock. It will, of course, also raise cash to fund the NIC cuts that Simon talked about earlier. Um, Tom told me his mother-in-law's got a furnished holiday let. Lots of other people in the room will have furnished, furnished holiday lets or know someone that does. Uh, they offered several advantages over regular buy-to-let properties. The availability of capital allowances or new fixtures and fittings and mortgage interest relief, both making a big difference to the level of taxable profits compared to other landlords. In addition, profits from furnished holiday lets currently count as net relevant earnings for pension purposes. And so for individuals where FHL rental income is their main or only source of income, this is going to basically mean they can no longer make tax relief pension contributions. The loss of the capital gains tax reliefs is likely to be even more costly, particularly the loss of business asset disposal relief and the associated 10% CGT rate. The additional CGT costs will run to tens of thousands of pounds in many cases. And for many others, the changes could significantly increase their IHT liability if business property relief is currently available to them. But year on year, is it really going to make a difference for the average FHL landlord? Well, we can see from this slide that for a furnished holiday let generating 50k a year with average mortgage and maintenance costs, the income tax payable is going to double from 6,400 a year to 12,800 a year for a 40% taxpayer. And what about VAT? Well, currently, if income from furnished holiday lets is above the VAT threshold, the landlord is required to register for VAT and charge VAT on the rentals. The draft legislation is not yet available, and we won't know for sure until we see the small print, but there's no reason to assume that the VAT position will change. I think it's likely that landlords offering short-term lets will see themselves with none of the tax advantages that were previously available, but still having to charge VAT on the rentals. There is also a big question mark as to what will happen with capital allowance pools on the 5th of April 25, when the existing regime comes to an end. I chatted this through last night with others in the team, um, and we think the most likely answer is that they will just disappear, with no balancing charges arising on the one hand, but no further capital allowances on unrelieved expenditure on the other hand. Again, though, we will need to wait and see. And in view of all this, are we going to see a rush to sell furnished holiday lets in the next 12 months so that landlords can bank business asset disposal relief and the associated 10% CGT rate? I think we might. On the subject of uh, um, CGT rates, um, on the subject of CGT rates, the tax team all watched the budget together yesterday. And when the Chancellor said that he would be making changes to capital gains tax, there were a few sharp intakes of breath around the table. But the much-feared alignment of CGT with income tax was not announced. And instead, Mr Hunt went the other way, and he cut the top rate of CGT on residential property um, from 28% down to 24%. It's worth noting, though, that although the FHL changes don't take effect until April 25, the reduction in CGT rates for residential property apply from April 2024. So if anyone in the audience or anyone listening online is in the process of selling a second property, they might want to wait a few weeks until they exchange contracts to ensure the lower 24% rate applies and save themselves a few quid. Um, so the removal of the FHL criteria might cause some problems. The first is a return of the uncertainty um, as to whether or not a taxpayer is conducting a property trade in respect to the property in question. Um, in order to preserve some of the benefits, Owners might look to switch their activity to serviced accommodation, but this strategy could be subject to HMRC challenges if the owner does not provide sufficient services to qualify as a trade. These changes might also result in a reduction in the number of properties available for holiday lets, which could impact local tourism and reduce profits in other sectors. 
So what should owners of FHLs do now? Well, with the end in sight for um, furnished holiday let capital allowances, it might be worth carrying out a review of historic expenditure to make sure that all possible capital allowance claims have been made. Similarly, you should also consider future expenditure. If you're planning on refurbing your holiday let, you might want to do it sooner rather than later if it means that the expenditure will be eligible for 100% annual investment allowance. But most importantly, talk to your advisor. For each landlord, these changes are going to impact their income tax, CGT, inheritance tax, and pension positions very differently. And so there's no one size fits all solution. Moving now to stamp duty land tax. A month or so ago, we were asked to make budget predictions. Mine was that the government will respond to a sluggish housing market by making changes to SDLT rates, similar to those introduced during COVID. Was I right? Have I got a future career as a psychic medium? No, absolutely not. Totally got it wrong. There were no changes to SDLT rates at all, and both the residential and non-residential rates remain exactly the same. There was also no mention of making the change to first-time buyers relief permanent, which means that from the 1st of April 2025, this relief will revert back to the previous rates. The big SDLT announcement was in relation to multiple dwellings relief, or MDR. MDR is a relief that reduces the stamp duty land tax payable by purchasers who are buying two or more dwellings in a single transaction or in linked transactions. In this example, the purchaser spent a million quid and bought a main house worth 800,000 um, and there was a small cottage in the grounds worth 200,000. In that case, a claim to MDR resulted in them saving just over 16,000 pounds. However, for um, transactions completing on or after the 1st of June this year, MDR claims will no longer be possible. If contracts have already been exchanged, however, transitional rules apply, meaning that MDR can still be claimed even if completion takes place after this date. Okay, looking at the clock, um, I'm going to have to skip the toilet, uh, which is not something I'd usually recommend, but moving on. Um, the abolition of MDR will not affect the subsidiary dwellings rules. In the previous example, the £1 million purchase price was split 800-200, which meant that the smaller property accounted for only 20% of the total cost. However, where the smaller dwelling accounts for more than a third of the total cost, as in this example, the smaller property is treated as a second residential purchase that attracts the 3% surcharge rate. Um, it is clear that careful valuations are needed in these cases. Where there are multiple, multiple dwellings, namely six or more, this will continue to be treated as a non-residential transaction with a lower non-residential SDLT rates applying. To conclude, MDR was introduced in 2011 to reduce the barrier to investment in residential property and increase the housing supply in the private rental sector. However, data shows that 51% of MDR claims, more than half, are made by individuals who are simply buying properties for private use. And it's clear that the government thinks MDR has failed, which is why they're abolishing it. Instead, they've decided to have another roll of the same dice, this time getting rid of the FHL regime and hoping that this is more successful in increasing the availability of longer term rentals. I'll report back to you next year on whether I think it's worked. But for now, I will hand you back to our mutual friend. That's Dickens, that's Dickens. Um, or as we call him, the BFG, Mr. Jason Fares. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your morning.